Hey there, Solar Warriors. I'm Nico Johnson, and this is Suncast. Each week, I pull back the veil on the life and business insights of clean tech entrepreneurs building the most noble and impactful companies of our time. I hope what you learn from this conversation is a catalyst for your own growth. So thanks for tuning in and welcome to our tribe. Hey there, Solar Warrior. Welcome back to another Tactical Tuesday, a short form conversation with subject matter experts designed to give you the practical tools, tips and advice to build your clean energy business and career. I try to keep these under a half hour. That keeps you on your way as you're commuting to work or in this pandemic era, perhaps just walking around the block with your kids or your dog or washing the dishes as I often do as I'm listening to these podcasts. This is week, we have a really great in-depth look at what it looks like to build out a project that incorporates a massive battery component to it. So energy storage is all the rage in California and in fact, all over the renewable energy landscape in the world. And it occurred to me that there's at least one missing element to the conversation for understanding how and why folks are able to monetize and sort of deploy these battery systems. And that is a term called resource adequacy. Today, we're going to dive into what is resource adequacy? Why does it matter? Who's involved in the discussion? And we're going to do that with my friend, Will Mitchell. Will is the director of origination for the Western United States for Strata Solar, massive EPC and development outfit out of my home state of North Carolina. He's responsible for biz dev and customer relationships government and policy affairs. You'll hear a lot more about that on Thursday. So I I would encourage you to tune in to that episode when it goes live. And I would encourage you to subscribe in your podcast player and subscribe to the Suncast Tribe newsletter so you don't miss what we're up to as we try to give you more insight throughout the week. For now, let's get ready to tune up your skills, Solar Warrior, as we tune in to another powerful conversation here on suncast will welcome to suncast my friend it is a long time coming i'm so stoked to have you uh, not only a long time listener but a friend and advocate out in california for all things solar and renewables man your track record in the california market not just with strata but before at recurrent and so many other roles it is an emblem of how to grow a career and be open to the possibility of new ideas. I'm glad to have you on the show today. We're going to dive deep on one specific topic, but it's good to hear your voice again. Nico, thanks for having me on. Always great to be talking to you. Absolutely, man. Hey, I know that things are a little bit uh, wacky everywhere these days, and you're a volunteer firefighter. Any any funny stories lately uh, as, a, as a volunteer out there trying to save lives that are uh, perhaps not even uh, COVID-related? Funny you ask, Stinson Beach, where I live, it's a real small town, about half of downtown blew up last week from a propane explosion, rocked our house, which is up the hill, rocked pretty much every house in town. Holy smokes. Myself, my friends, uh, my father-in-law all went kind of bombing down the hill of the firehouse to find like three buildings in downtown Stinson completely on fire. And Mm. uh, that was a heck of a way to start a Tuesday just a week ago. And I got to put hats off to my uh, my father-in-law, who I live next door. He's 72 years old, was manning the engine all day, just like he always does. He's been on the fire department over 50 years. And, wow. um, you know, no one got hurt, which is great. But it's another just, you know, this community comes together when stuff gets crazy. So funny enough, that was a wild week last week. You guys, if uh, if anybody has gotten used to the idea of wearing a respirator or a, uh, or a filter, <laughs> it's uh, firefighters. How do you get used to that feeling that you're like suffocating with this thing on your face? Honestly, the best I can tell you is you got to stop and focus on the breathing for a minute because sometimes you feel like you're hyperventilating and it's pretty weird, but you literally just got to take a minute, slow it all down, just like anything else. The art of being present. Well, look, we're going to get present right now with a very real and present, perhaps danger, but certainly reality for our market. We're going to do so through the lens of unpacking what I think is a complex topic. It probably for many like me is a topic that most won't have a whole lot of experience with unless you're like really on, down the rabbit hole of policy making and rate making and uh, developing utility scale solar projects, frankly. And that is a term called resource adequacy. 
it wasn't that long ago you and I were on a phone call and I was like, wait, 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 rewind. What is RA? And you sort of took for granted that I knew what it was. And I, I, I'm the first to admit that I don't always know all these terms, but I understand there's a term that folks colloquially refer to as RA. Can you help me unpack what is resource adequacy and, and why do I care? Absolutely. It's about reliability. It's about ensuring the resources are there for reliability, your bottom dollar commitments. In California, reliability or resource adequacy was a originally a legislative construct that became a regulatory construct after the energy crisis, uh, the Enron energy crisis. And it essentially, the load serving entities in California have to show on a year ahead and a month ahead basis that they've got all the resources they need plus a margin of error to keep the lights on throughout their service territories. This is kind of the old adage. It's not how much water is going to flow through the pipes. It's how big the pipes are or vice versa, right? Like the idea, I think about it in Central America where the markets are much smaller and they have a lot of similar things to think about from a demand perspective. They have to consider when everything's turned on and the hottest day of the summer how much power is going to be drawn down and then they sort of back in to how would we serve that load? Is that, is that sort of similar? Yeah. So there's, there's constantly forecasting going on from the independent system operator, the public utility commission, frankly, the individual load serving entities, whether that's like a pg e or a community choice aggregator, and they're all coming together and saying, all right, we need X power in January, February, March, April on a month basis. And then on an annual basis, we need, you know, even more power. And then they go out and they procure it. Solar gets resource adequacy credit, natural gas units get resource, every different resource in the system, it's a certain amount of resource adequacy credit. And frankly, it's where most of the value is. And so when you talk about projects getting financed, solar projects, traditionally gas projects, usually in California, it's because of the value that they are providing for resource adequacy, how much money they're getting paid for resource adequacy in most instances is kind of the underlying financial instrument that the banks are lending against and investors are interested in. I get it because this is the actual power that can be provided rather than the energy that you can yield, right? That's right. That's right. This is not energy. This is power. That's right. This is like saying... Instead, my car goes 300 miles per hour. I have a car with a 450 SS you know, power block and it's capacity. And just because you're paying somebody for resource adequacy doesn't mean you're calling on them. It's, right. you know, it's as much about an availability and insurance payment. It's to ensure that it's a reliability payment. That's really what, what it's here. It's essentially what peakers are built for, right? Traditionally, it is what peakers were built for. But as storage has come in, it's totally upended the industry as solar plus storage has come in, it's totally upended. You know, it's no longer just about natural gas power plants. And frankly, a lot of the original RA construct was built around performance expectations of gas plants. And we all know storage can do stuff faster and it's changing the market fast. Interesting. Well, for those who don't know, you actually spend some time outside of the solar industry. Feel free to give some context there, if you will. I know that you have experience sort of about the RA markets um, developing all the way back to Enron. I'd love to hear some, some about that. But as we do, I'd love for you to continue, because part of this is to set a bit of the stage for Thursday, help set the stage for why RA matters, in particular with regards to storage applications. Absolutely. So in California, the California market, resource adequacy is you know one of the biggest drivers both for supply and demand, right? The developers are always looking to see, is there enough RA in the market? Is it clearing? Are prices low? Are prices high? And then citing projects around that and then bidding projects offering resource adequacy values. And so coming out of the energy crisis about 19, 20 years ago, it was all about natural gas. And so there was natural gas plants getting built with getting long-term RA. So the RA can get picked up in short-term as little as like a month increment sometimes one year, two years, or 10 or 20 years. And so, of course, those short-term strips are usually for existing assets. So right now in California, the existing assets that would be going after that are almost exclusively natural gas. Yeah. But all the new storage that's getting built, those are largely are on RA contracts. Wow, um, okay. Solar plus storage, a lot of RA value there. Now, you're getting rec value and energy value with solar plus storage, but the underlying investment driver for new development in California 
is largely a resource adequacy payment over a long period of time, 10, 20 years, etc. This episode is also brought to you by Adani Solar USA, a fully integrated renewables company from solar sale and module manufacturing to project ownership and operation. Adani has an impressive operating and contracted pipeline of over 14 gigawatts of solar energy projects and recently received the largest solar award ever of eight gigawatts. It's mind blowing. And it includes a single site project of two gigawatts, which itself is tied for the world's largest. No one knows mega scale projects like Adani. If you'd like to work with Adani, go to mysuncast.com forward slash Adani, A-D-A-N-I, and fill out the information request form and we'll put you in touch with their local team. You shared an article with me recently that for me kind of pulled back the veil and I'd like for us to talk about it and certainly hat tip to the folks at Woodmac Green Tech Media. Jeff St. John wrote this article back on June 15th about a bit of a scuffle happening at the regulatory level around RA in California that, in my view, didn't get nearly the airtime that it potentially should have given what you've described to me as a tectonic shift in rate making or you know, regulation and policy. Can you help me unpack what are the two sides of this argument and how is it going to play itself out specifically with regards to solar plus storage? Huge changes happening in the resource adequacy market in California. So about two weeks ago, the Public Utility Commission voted on what I think probably can be described as a fairly controversial decision here in California that essentially took the local control or local procurement of resource adequacy largely away from the community choice aggregators. And so I think it's worth just kind of describing, you know, the, the community choice aggregators are the alternatives to the IOU. So in pg e territory, there's at this point like 12 or so community choice aggregators that are known as load serving entities, and they all go out and procure their own resources, short-term, long-term, et cetera. Where it gets a little tricky, the Public Utility Commission doesn't exactly have regulatory control or regulatory authority over the community choice aggregators. And so you quickly get into this conflicting area where the Public Utility Commission and the ISO are responsible for reliability, but they don't necessarily have the authority to regulate these entities who are procuring for reliability. And it's created some complications. Now, to the CCA's credit, they are procuring like crazy. There's probably a CCA solicitation every month, more than that if you're including short-term, long-term. But the Public Utility Commission had some concerns about market power, had concerns about reliability. They weren't necessarily sure they were liking what was going on. So they actually went ahead and implemented a new resource adequacy structure that puts it back in the hands of the IOUs who they regulate. So there's definitely some, you know, serious, serious policy battles going on in California between these up and coming CCAs who are all about local control, local management, local resources, and then the state public utility commission regulating the IOUs. And we all know the IOUs and the CCAs, you know, are are not exactly friends. They're at odds, yeah. They're totally at odds. And so this decision just happened about two weeks ago. The reality is I don't think anybody's exactly sure, even the CCAs, as to like the long-term implications, people are still trying to figure out exactly how this works. There's some working groups, but it's a monumental change because the way the IOUs look at local power is a heck of a lot different than a CCA that looks at local power and who pays for it, what's important to each party, what's important to pg e when procuring local resources is probably not the same as what's important to marine clean energy when they're procuring local resources. So this is a big deal in California. You know, it's exacerbated by the fact that CCAs are now serving nearly half of PG&E's customers. As pointed out in this article, it was a huge growing contingent, uh, a force we reckon with in Southern California. And, and I would argue, as they say, as goes California, so goes the nation. Like this is, an, this is a growing trend across the U.S. So all eyes right now are on this CPUC decision. And of course, the CPUC and the utilities are, are going to be sort of in agreement on the way that these decisions should be made. And it's, it, it's funny to me, almost laughable. There's a quote here by the CPUC commissioner. He says, having numerous entities buying small strips of local re- resource adequacy is not cost-effective and creates market power concerns. 
And he goes on to say that getting a single entity purchasing power consolidation with PG&E and SEE will help to avoid that. And it says a view supported by both utilities. Uh, duh, of course, it's supported, supported by both utilities that you just gave all of the buying power in the, in the state back to instead of with the CCAs. <laughs> How do you see this playing out as it relates to the numerous RA solicitations that solar providers and storage providers were bidding on? Uh, do you think this is going to have an impact on the ability to compete? Is it going to, you know, is it going to, are we going to see market shifts on the kinds of assets deployed, the kinds of companies who are able to deploy those assets competitively? What are your prognostications on the impact of this consolidation of buying power? So yet to be seen, for one, there's some working groups that still have to happen. And so, of course, you know, especially in California, the regulatory process never ends. I also suspect that not this legislative session, because it's pretty much focused on the budget and COVID response, but next legislative session come January, this this is probably going to be the CCA's number one or number two issue. I haven't talked to them about it, but that's just my gut. So in California, when you don't like something, you go to the legislature and and try to get a law changed. And I got to hand it to the CCA's. They have incredibly growing clout. They've got good staff, good team up there. So I think this story is far from over, even if you do see some more working groups. The reality is for the developer community, let's call it the greenfield developer community that's looking to put new steel in the ground, this has the biggest uncertainty because those short-term strips that you referenced there, those are for existing assets. Those are for and largely existing gas plants. I mean, there's not a whole bunch of solar or certainly any storage that I'm aware of in California that is maybe one project, but that doesn't have an existing contract on it. So those are for uncontracted resources that are old and just kind of keeping the train going. When it comes to new resources being built in local areas, you know, before, let's take East Bay, for example, clean energy, big CCA, great team doing a lot of local resource procurement in the Oakland load pocket, which is really complicated. Now, now the question is, okay, so East Bay valued that development in the Oakland load pocket, not just for reliability purposes, but also for resiliency purposes, economic development purposes, workforce development purposes, kind of their own energy future purposes. The question is, is PG&E got to prescribe that same consideration and that same value to someone bidding a project in downtown Oakland, which frankly might be a little more expensive than a project outside of the city, but still has the same RA value electrically. How does that work, right? So now these local entities, which are really trying to jumpstart their clean energy futures in their economy, there's competing priorities, there's competing interests. Who has the final say? This decision basically says the IOUs have the final say for now. For now. And it looks like it's also going to, in the short term, stymie some of the ongoing activity. I mean, frankly, there are joint procurement agreements among at least the Bay Area CCAs. And there's a you know small concern right now <laughs> with wildfire prevention and blackouts that are being imposed by PG&E that local RA and the CCAs are actively procuring against to back up these communities who face these brownouts and blackouts and and wildfire situations. There's a lot of consternation, a lot of nail biting, I would say, in the market at the moment. And it could go either way. It'd be interesting. It will be interesting to watch how the local CCA market and the local Greenfield developers respond and put themselves together. As we monitor the situation, certainly will be helping keep us on top of the options. And we will be uh, letting you all know how you can take action and mostly how you can stay informed so that we as an industry can help align these policies to benefit our goals and needs and, and purposes. In the meantime, I want to thank Will Mitchell, the Director of Origination from Strata, for his valuable insight and uh, profound uh, explanation of a, a subject that I had very little knowledge of before. I would encourage you all to check out the episode that we have coming on Thursday with Will and his teammates from Strata as they talk about a massive battery project that they've been busy at work at through the COVID-19 process. That's coming Thursday. Will, thank you for taking your time to be here on Suncast and with us today. Nico, thanks for having me. Always great speaking with you and your listeners. That's a wrap on this conversation, Warrior, but I do hope that we'll see you back here on Thursday for this week's long form interview. I also encourage you to check out other episodes of Suncast, and let me know what you think of these shorter form discussions. Do you want more like this? 
We've got hundreds of episodes, resources, and highlights from these discussions, along with the social media links for each episode guest, book recommendations, and so much more over at mysuncast.com. And that's also where you'll find other ways to engage with our Suncast tribe, like subscribing to our weekly tribe exclusive emails or even joining our exclusive inner circle of infinite learners and clean economy champions we affectionately refer to as the Guild. If you're on Spotify or iTunes, I do so appreciate your rating and review so that others can also find Suncast more easily. And a special thank you to our sponsors who help make this podcast possible. You can learn more about them at mysuncast.com forward slash sponsor, as well as learn more about becoming a sponsor if that's something you're interested in. You can follow the links there as well to any of the offers that we've discussed about any of our sponsors here today. Remember, you are what you listen to. Thanks again for showing up, Solar Warrior. It's half the battle.